Okay. First of all, we'd like to say shalom to the brothers and sisters on this Sabbath. We have some key information that we need to bring out today. And hopefully you receive it through the Spirit of the Most High. Uh, and uh, we're going to first deal with the understanding of Christ's resurrection in the first and, and the misunderstanding that Christians have with the first day of the week or Christ rising on a Sunday. We're going to deal with that in, in perfect detail. As you all know, we brought out a lesson not too long ago that's showing that the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbaths, are right on point. That means Friday sundown to seven, Saturday sundown, which they call so-called Friday to so-called Saturday, have always been the seventh day of the week since the beginning, before the Romans named those days Friday or Saturday after their gods. Okay, it's always been this and, and what we did, we did a complete lesson. You can go online to see how uh, the complete cycle through 364 days, you get seven into those 364 days, 52 times. So there's a Sabbath, 52 Sabbaths per year. You cannot do this through the moon. We also showed in prior lessons that if you go through the moon or go to the moon, you throw off the cycles of the year. We also showed in that prior lesson uh, uh, that they were able, well, the powers that be were able to throw off days by giving us what you would call a solar year, you understand, and starting it a little later or a little earlier than the times according to the, the book of Enoch to throw off the time so that if you do know it's 364, you will still have your Sabbaths disturbed. But through the Spirit of the Most High, we went into Enoch, we went into the extra biblical text along with the Bible to show you that you cannot calculate Sabbaths or holy days according to the moon. When you look at the word moon there, it means month. Okay? The moon in space, or the moon, which is a luminary, is a different Hebrew word, Yarak. You good? Mm -hmm. It's a different Hebrew word, Yarak. So the moon in the sky means Yarak. Okay? The moon that you see when it comes to holy days in scripture means month. But we know months are calculated differently according to the 364 day cycle. Okay, there's no 365 days in the years, 364. All right. Now, Lincoln bringing this together because most people were confused. Well, if the Passover they was asking was on a Sabbath, which we know it is, then how is it that three days later, when they went to the sepulchre, it said the first day of the week after Christ was crucified? Wouldn't that mean that the next day after Christ was crucified on a Sabbath, that the first day of the week was the next day? Therefore, where is the three days and three nights according to the resurrection? We're going to show you and clear up this confusion. A matter of fact, they purposely put that confusion in for a specific purpose so that you wouldn't know or you wouldn't observe the Sabbaths properly or the holy days properly. We are not to count according to the moon. That's what the Gentiles do. That's how we fell in old time. We are to count our Sabbaths every week, Sabbath to Sabbath. All right. Now, to give you all a recap, on the 14th day, according to Leviticus, which is the second week of the first month, it's a Sabbath, which is the Lord's Passover, to show us that the Passover falls on Friday sundown every year. Why? Because it's on a weekly Sabbath every year. 
The Feast of Unleavened Bread always fall a day after it, which is sundown Sabbath, Saturday or sundown after the Sabbath. The same as Leviticus 23 mentions. Now, we're going to give you some information. Get your pen and pads ready. And if those who don't have their pen and pad, you have your recording here. You can always go back and reference. We're going to show you the deception. All right. And we're going to begin the deception by giving you a quote concerning the deceivers. All right. And we're going back to whom you would know as Constantine. Now, you can always find this online yourself. It's a background of history concerning Sunday worship. Okay. For those who wish to receive this link, uh, just reach out to us. Uh, matter of fact, we'll put the link on our web page so you'll have it. So we don't have to go through a bunch of emails strictly for requests in this particular document. But this is just a historical document giving us information on why the Christian church today predominantly deals with Sunday worship. I need you to read in the second paragraph here. And this information is put up under Nazarene of Mount Carmel. And this particular website that I went to on this one strictly deal with history and quotes of historians. So it's nothing that uh, you understand. It's nothing that's, that, that's not credible concerning those quotes that came from the adversaries, the, the people, the Romans, who tricked the world into following their holy day and their gods. This is their quotes. Let's first start with uh, in 727 CE, the Roman Emperor Aurelian begins the new sun cult. I need you to read in 274. In 274 CE. This the, is the Romans. The Roman Emperor Aurelian begins new sun cult. In 274, Aurelian created a new cult of the invincible sun, worshipped in a splendid temple, served by pontiffs, who were raised to the level of ancient pontiffs of Rome. Now, these are the same pontiffs that are under the Roman Catholic Church today. As you can see, they have nothing to do, they have absolutely nothing to do with Christ and the disciples. These pontiffs were established as high priests under the Roman sun cult. Read. It says, level of ancient pontiff, pontiffs of Rome celebrated every fourth year by magnificent games. Sol Invictus was definitely promoted to the highest rank in the divine hierarchy and became the official protector of the sovereign and of the empire. Aurelian, or he, placed in his new sanctuary the images of Bel and Helios, which he captured at Palmyra. In establishing this new state cult, Aurelian in reality proclaimed the dethronement of the old Roman idolatry and the accession of Semitic sun worship. This side real theology founded on ancient beliefs of Chaldean astrologers transformed in the Hell Hellenistic age under the twofold influence of astronomic discoveries and Stoic thought was promoted after becoming a pantheistic sun worship to the rank of official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, the sources that they drew from for this particular cult, uh, this partic particular, excuse me, quote, is Franz Cumont, Astrology and Religion Among the Greeks and the Romans. Again, this source came from Franz Cumont and the book called Astrology and Religion among the Greeks and Romans. Here's the initial institution of sun worship from ancient Rome. Now, if you wonder why our people worship on Sunday today, we were conquered by the Jesuits or Romans who came over to the Americas and enslaved our people. So by default, we were tricked into believing that we were worshiping our God and our Christ 
when we were really worshiping the spirit of Antichrist given to us by the Roman Empire. The next, it says, first Sunday law enacted by Emperor Constantine. Now this is three centuries, almost three centuries after Christ. First Sunday law enacted by Emperor Constantine, March 321 AD. The emperor is the true legislature, legislator of Sunday worship, not a man as some purpose. Okay? So, I need you to read this from 321, and this particular source came from Kodak's Justinius, Trans of Philip Schaff, History of the Christian Church, Volume 3. Okay? Now, here's, here's quotes in Christian literature which allow us or will allow you to figure out the purpose of Sunday worship is actually the world religion and bringing in people or voluntarily deceiving Christians into following the spirit of Antichrist established by the Romans. Now some people say well what about the Muslims? Well the Catholic Church established that too. It's the same universal church in Arabic. An antichrist. So they uphold Muhammad opposed to Christ. The same way the Catholic Church will uphold the Pope. As who? As they call the Pontus Father. Total blasphemous, blaspheming against the Most High God. Now, read the quote from this particular source. Codex Justinians. It says, on the venerable day of the sun... Let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest. Let them rest on what? The day of the what? Day of the sun. So here's Constantine instituting a law that people will rest on Sunday opposed to the Sabbath of rest commanded in the Bible. Opposed to the Sabbath Christ was following in the Bible. Read. And let all workshops be closed. Let all workshops be closed. Now, this is not the most high telling us to close all shops and not to work or do anything. This is the Roman Empire taking the most high's law and applying it to Sunday. Read. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not suitable for grain growing or for vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. That means let's make sure we keep the finances going. So the agriculturalists and those that are, that are at, the, at the pinnacle of our finances as far as agriculture dealing with the land we're going to allow them to continue to do that because we need that for finances we need that to keep a society going so he instituted this law read uh, given the seventh day of March Crispus and Constantine being councils of each of them for the second time 321 AD 321 AD Here's the transition from paganism to Christianity. Read. This legislation by Constantine probably bore no relation to Christianity. It had nothing to do with whether or not you were following Christ, this Sunday institution to worship the sun, or have Sunday be a day of rest. Now you would think the Christian pastors and those that follow Christ would look at the origin of the day they worship instead of claiming it doesn't matter. If it don't matter, then why do you religiously do it every Sunday? It was instituted by Satanist. Read. It appears, on the contrary, that the emperor and his capacity of Pontifex Maximus was only adding the day of the sun, the worship of which then firmly established in the Roman Empire, to the other ferial days of the sacred calendar. What began, however, as a pagan ordinance ended as a Christian regulation. Now it became a Christian regulation, which means its origin was in paganism and now picked up by the new Christians outside of Christ, outside of the teachings that was given to the disciples, an anti-Christ institution. Read. 
What began, however, as a pagan ordinance ended as a Christian regulation and a long series of imperial decrees during the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries in joint with increasing, increasing stingency, abstinence from labor on Sunday. You could not work on Sunday, a Roman law. So here it is, they'll tell you that our law was done with as written of in the Bible so that you could follow man's law. Many shall come in my name, like Christ says. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. That means you will switch this and say that it's under Christ you're doing it. Read. Uh, moving to the next quote, it states, The church made a sacred day of Sunday, largely because it was the weekly festival of the sun. Because it was the what? The weekly festival of the sun. It was the weekly celebration of the sun. Worship in a luminary. Read. For it was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals and dare to the people by tradition and to give them a Christian significance. Now check this out. Listen to this clearly. Can 16. Read. Uh... Can 16, on Saturday, Greek Sabbaton, the Sabbath. And this is the canon laws of Lacedonia, so you can understand. These are actual records that can be gotten. Read. Uh, on Saturday, Greek Sabbaton, the Sabbath, the Gospels and other portions of the Scripture shall be read aloud. So on the Saturday, other portions of the Scripture shall be read aloud. Read Canon 29. Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. Read on. During Lent, the bread shall not be offered except on Saturday and Sunday. Go ahead. During Lent, no feast of the martyrs shall be celebrated, but the holy martyrs shall be commemorated on Saturdays and S Sundays of Lent. Now they started transitioning by having it Saturdays and Sundays originally, then they moved all the holy days of eventually to their target Sunday, bringing it back to the original institution from 274 B.C. So they eased it. They let Saturday work along with Sunday for a while, and then afterwards they moved Saturday, the Sabbath out of the way altogether, which was the original plan, to deceive Christ's worshipers and those Jews or Israelites that believed the Sabbath was holy, to trick them into discarding their day altogether and following and worshiping the sun god, Ra or the Babylonian god Talmuz and Nimrod. Now, where are we going with this? Let's bring this all together. We put together a lesson to show, and we're going to prove to you all today, that Christ did not rise on a Sunday. A matter of fact, a matter of fact, in the Greek, we're going to read it, the first day of the week in the Greek is not even there. In the places where the scripture said that Mary, the Marys went to the sepulchre upon the first day of the week. When you do the translation, it's not even there. And we're going to give you the correct translation today. When was Christ crucified? Christ was crucified on a Saturday. Okay, he was crucified on a Saturday. When did he rise? Three days later, nowhere near Sunday, and I'm going to prove it today. So if Christ didn't rise nowhere near Sunday, what is we dealing with? What are we dealing with here? Why did they deceive you with that first day of the week? To bring you into the worshiping of the sun. We're going to prove it. But in or, on top of that, we're going to also give this, make this an opportunity where we can show 
how you can actually break this down too. But you cannot do it without understanding the Old Testament's law. And that's the reason Christians tell their followers, Christian pastors, don't worry about the Old Testament. You need the Old Testament to break down Christ's death and resurrection. And to follow his holy days. Now, I need you to first go to Matthew, the 26th chapter, and the first verse. Matthew 26 and 1. Now, mind you, we've already proven in our past video, all right, that Friday sundown, the so-called Friday sundown, let me call it so-called because there's no such thing as Friday or Saturday. According to the Most High, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, rest. It's 7. It was man that named the sixth day Friday and the, and the seventh day Saturday. But for the sake of conversation so that you'll understand what we're talking about, we'll use those terms. We'll use the days of the week that they call so that if someone come on these videos who don't know, they'll be able to immediately relate and follow what we're saying. So we're going to use the words they've given us, knowing that those words are injected all together. The Most High never named the first day of the week Sunday. He never named the seventh day of the week Saturday and so and so forth. All right. Now, let's start at the book of Matthew 26 1 and 2 St. Matthew chapter 26 verse 1 and it came to pass when Yeshua had finished all these sayings he said unto his disciples ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified now we're going to give you a time stamp to understand when this particular quote happened during the time of the week. What day of the week, if we we're looking at it from our understanding, what day of the week did Christ make this statement? In order to understand this, let's go way back to the Old Testament, like I said I was going to do earlier, to Leviticus 23. Right? And let's go straight to the seventh day when it, when it tells us about the Sabbath. Read it. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3. Go ahead. Six days shall work be done. Six days work shall be done. But the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. But the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Okay. According to what we know today as far as n the name of days. Read. In holy convocation ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Most High. It is the Sabbath. Read. In all your dwellings. Go ahead. Verse 4. These are the feasts of the Most High. Even holy convocations which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Go ahead. In the 14th day of the first month. Now here it is seven days later. First you had the regular Sabbath. Okay. From the first of the year. And now you have the second week. Which is the 14th day. Which is what? The next Friday. Read is what? In the 14th day of the first month at evening. Is the Most High's Passover. Is the Most High's Passover. So if we know that fell on a Friday night sundown then what day did Christ make this quote in Matthew 26? Let's go back to Matthew 26. St. Matthew chapter 26 verse 1. Go ahead. And it came to pass when Yeshua had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. You know that in two days is the feast of the Passover. So what day Christ was speaking here? Two days before Friday. He's speaking on a Wednesday. See that? Read. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And the Son of Man is to betrayed to be crucified. So Christ is speaking here two days before he's betrayed by Judas. Right? 
Now, let's get this betrayal. Let's, in the same chapter, let's go down to the 14th and 15th verse. Read. St. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. And the first day of the feast, or now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Yeshua, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? You see that now they're preparing for the Passover two days later. This is Friday day. So the same day the disciples is asking Christ, well, where are we going to keep the Passover? Where are we going to get the Passover? Was the same day that Judas went to the Pharisees and scribes in an attempt to hand Christ over to them. This is Friday during the day, two days later. How do we know this? The second verse tell us, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man is to be betrayed. See that? So now we're Friday. Now, think about this. If we're now on Friday night and Christ haven't even been crucified yet, how is it that after he was crucified the day later, then three days later he rose would be Sunday? Impossible. This is nowhere near Sunday when Christ rise. And they knew this. Stick with me. I have more. Finish reading what you have in Matthew. St. Matthew chapter 26 verse 18. And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. I will keep the Passover at my house with my disciples. So he's saying tonight we will keep the Passover. Read. Verse 19. And the disciples did as Yeshua had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. And they made ready the Passover. Let's go to Mark 14 and 1. 14 and 1, and read down to the 10th verse. St. Mark chapter 14, verse 1. Go ahead. After two days was the feast of the Passover. And of Same thing, read. And of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. So let's not do it during the day. Don't forget, they seen Christ earlier that day and, and did nothing. They didn't want to do it in front of the people or the, because Christ's followers would have fell on them. Read. Verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she brake the box and poured it on his head. Go ahead. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why, waste this, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Yeshua said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She have wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. Verse 8. She have done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she have done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Judas... Now here, here it comes, because now this guy is offended that Christ didn't use this precious oil that could have been used for the poor. So now he have indignation against his brother, and now he's about to turn to, 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 to the enemies of Christ to betray him, and this is the day he did it, two days from the time that Christ spoke of. Read. Verse 10. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, one, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. Exactly. This is that betrayal two days from the time Christ spoke of. This is Friday 
day before the sun go down for the Passover feast. Okay? Now you'll never understand this if you deal with your Passovers according to the moon. And they did that on purpose too. So you, you would profane the Sabbaths and the Most High's holy days. And with this information, you know when Christ rose from the grave. You know when he was crucified and you understand when he rose. Which is significant. Suppose Christians run on this video and find out that Christ didn't rise nowhere near Sunday. Then what is the, the excuse for Sunday worship? You've been tricked. Read. I need you to go to the uh, 12th verse. Uh, St. Mark chapter 14 verse 12. And the first day of unleavened bread. And on the first day of unleavened bread, which we know is the Passover, read. When they killed the Passover. Because we know the Passover is killed on sundown Friday. How do we know that? Hold that and get Exodus the 12th chapter in the 6th verse. See how you need the Old Testament to confirm? Why? Because Christ was dealing with the holy days according to the Old Testament. How can Christians understand his crucifixion and say his holy days are done away with? You have no idea what the crucifixion is about if you don't know the holy days. But you've been tricked into ignoring the Bible holy days and taking on Christmas, which is Saturnalia, a Roman uh, 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 worship. Okay, taking on Easter, which is the, the worship of Semiramis, the mother of an antichrist, the virgin mother of Talmuz. Read Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. Read it. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. The 14th day of the same month, which is the second week, that Friday, read. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. In the evening. Now this is why we know the Passover was actually killed that night. That Friday night before the feast. Before Christ was betrayed. Because it was in the law. Christ is a fulfillment of the law. See that? So now we're at Friday. The Passover feast. The Passover lamb have been killed now. Right? Let's go to Mark 14 and 12. And let's read that again. St. Mark chapter 14 verse 12. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover. When they killed the Passover, showing you that the Passover is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Technically. Read. His disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? So where are we going to eat? The animal we have just killed for your Passover feast. Read. Verse 13. And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. Go ahead. Verse 14. And wheresoever he go, shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house. The master saith, Where is the guest chamber? where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. Okay, now let's go to John 18 and 3. Let's get some more confirmation. Here's some more precepts that you can always get. As a matter of fact, let's get these precepts too. Let's go to Luke 22 and 1. Let's not leave anything out. Luke 22 and 1. St. Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Go ahead. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. More proof that the Passover is really a day included within the feast of unleavened bread so it's draweth nigh it was coming read verse 2 and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him for they feared the people then entered satan into judas surnamed iscariot when did the spirit of satan entered into judas when he was upset that christ was anointed from all this precious oil read being of the number of the twelve and he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains. We know this is Friday day. Going into more detail. Go ahead. How he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenant with, uh, to give him money. And this is more information. This is more proof. And I'm going to say this. A lot of us, and I was mentioning this amongst the brethren before we came on today. That, the, that 
it don't matter what the Illuminati do and what FEMA are going to do and all that. We just put those things out there and talk about it so that you could be conscious of the signs of the times. The biggest threat comes from those that are close to you. Those are they that will betray you or give you up to the government to be killed. That's the biggest threat, not the threat on the outside, but the threat within. It have always been the, th the threat within that have destroyed our people. And I wanted to put that out because here's a prime example. You have the enemies of Christ meeting together and are frustrated because they don't know how to get to him and afraid that the people might destroy. So what do they do? They had to wait for an opportunity to come where someone who was amongst Christ get offended that would give them all the inside details to take him down. And this have always been the way the system have destroyed us. Even in our modern times, if you look at Martin Luther King, he was betrayed by Jesse Jackson. When you look at Malcolm X, he was betrayed by Farrakhan. On and on and on and on. There's always one person that's going to get offended and say, you know what, I'm going to crash the whole thing down. They don't realize what they're crashing down is their own people, their own upliftment their own movement. They believe it's personal between them and a person when it's bigger than them. So they'll just wait for someone to get offended or get upset about something and, and Satan will enter that person and say, you know what? Take them down. That's the example I gave earlier. But let's get back on schedule according to the timeline is what I wanted to give you to prove that Christ did not rise on a Sunday morning and it was nowhere near Sunday. A matter of fact, he was crucified Saturday morning and rose three days from there. And I'm going to prove it. With the same scriptures that they try to use, I'm going to prove it. Luke, where are you? Uh, St. Luke chapter 22 verse 6 Go ahead. and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed Go ahead. and he sent Peter and John saying go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat and they said unto him where wilt thou that we prepare pre that we prepare verse 10 and he said unto them behold when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And ye shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And they made ready the Passover. They found the room in which they would have the Passover. And for those who are fairly new who don't know what to understand what the Passover is. In ancient times, before Israel became a nation, before our people came out of Egypt, the Most High told the Pharaoh to let our people go and refused. The Most High, one of the greatest plagues in modern, I mean, in ancient history, was the plague that the Most High sent, which was a death angel through Egypt to kill the firstborn. Those of our people and those that believe that the Most High sent Moses put blood on the door. And when the death angel came through, and the death angel was Christ, when the spirit came through, all those that had the blood on the door was protected from, from death. And and that spirit smit Pharaoh's son and killed all the Egyptians firstborn. And there was, a, there was a mourning through all of Egypt that was heard outside of Egypt from all the firstborn. Now, that's the true Christ and the true Most High that the Christians don't want you to know about. Okay? Who smit children because those children was going to grow to oppress God's people. All right. So the Most High made that a memorial to be commemorated throughout all of our generations to remember that time 
that those who believed had that blood to protect them. Now that sacrifice and blood is Christ. And when the death angel comes through this earth to destroy, again, those that, that have Christ's blood will be protected to understand the Passover appropriately. Getting back on schedule. Let's go to John 13 and 1. St. John chapter 13 verse 1. Go ahead. Now before the feast of the Passover. Now before the feast of the Passover. When Yeshua knew that his hour was come. That he should depart out of, out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world. Having loved everybody. Having loved his own which were in the world. Having loved his own which were in the world. So that's the world it's speaking of in John 3.16. His own which were in the world. Christ did not come for everybody or anybody. He didn't come for people who just want to live their lives and do what they want to do. And think that you're covered by the blood just simply because Christ came. It doesn't work that way. Read. He loved them unto the end. Everybody. He loved them unto the end. He loved them unto the end. Read. Verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. We know this is the day before Passover night. This is Friday day. Read. Verse 3. Yeshia, knowing that the Father had given all things to, into his hands, and that he was come from the Most High and went to the Most High, he riseth. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into, into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, I need you to hold there because he did this today for the, before the Passover feast. Now, let's go into the betrayal real quick. Let's go to John 18 and 3. St. John. Read. Chapter 18, verse 3. Go ahead. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, this is after, after the Passover feast. Read. Verse 4. Yeshia, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered and said, Yeshia of Nazareth. Yeshia say, saith unto him, I am he. And Judas also which betrayed him stood with him. Go ahead. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Yeshia of Nazareth. Yeshia answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, I, uh, me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then Yeshia said, un then said Yeshia unto Peter, Put thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father have given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Yeshia and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas. So now we're showing you right after the Passover feast, Judas bring guards to capture Christ. This is Friday night in the evening after their feast. See that? Now, we know that Christ was crucified the next day. He told Peter, you will deny me three times before the cock crow, which means before the morning comes. So we know the next day would have to have been the end of the Sabbath or Saturday morning after the betrayal. I mean, after the denial, Christ was crucified that day. Let's go there. Let's go to. Mark 14 and 72 after they've taken Christ read St. Mark chapter 14 verse 72 start at the 70th verse verse 70 and he denied it again and a little after they stood by they that stood by said to Peter surely thou art one of them 
for them. He's saying he's one of them. We got we have Christ. I think that's one of the gods that used to follow Christ, pointing to Peter. And Christ told him, You will deny me three times before the cock crow, before the morning comes in. When the cock crows in the morning, you know it's morning time. They they crow when they see the first light of the sun in the morning, automatically. Read. For thou art a Galilean. And thy speech agreeth thereto. Go ahead. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the crop crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Yeshia said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Now here it is the next morning. He cried, remember what Christ told him, knowing that he, he told Christ he would never deny him. And Christ, but Christ knew he would have to deny him to keep the work going. Or they would have crucified him too. He had to continue. You understand? So now. It's the next morning, Saturday morning, the Cockton crowed. They have Christ. They're, they're, they're beating Christ and doing things to Christ during this same period. Preparing him for his crucifixion. This is Saturday morning. Now, let's go to Matthew 26 and 34. St. Matthew chapter 26 verse 34. Go ahead. Yeshia said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. See that he said he wouldn't deny him, but as you can see, we've just read his denial. So this is giving us a chronological order of Christ's Passover to his crucifixion to show you that it was a day later. Because the same day after the cock crow, they brought him up for crucifixion, which is Saturday. More proof of that. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Mark 15 and 42. Read it. St. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. That was the day before the Sabbath. Read. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of the Most High, came and went and boldly unto Pilate, and craved the body of Yeshia. Now it says here that since it was the preparation the day before the Sabbath, when Joseph of Arimathea came to ask for Christ's body off of the cross after he was crucified, that would confuse some people because that would make you believe that it was a day before Thursday or a, a day before Friday but this Sabbath right here is not speaking of a regular Sabbath it's speaking of the Sabbath of the next day which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread and I'm going to prove that it's not speaking of a regular Sabbath because after Friday sundown Saturday sundown Passover there is another Sabbath, which is a high holy day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's get it. Let's get this preparation the next day. Go to Numbers 28, 16 through 19 to get this preparation that Joseph is speaking of. Numbers 28, 16 through 19. Read it. Uh, Numbers chapter 28, verse 16. And in the 14th day of the first month, is the Passover of the Most High. That's the Passover which we know as a Sabbath. Read. And then the 15th day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. Go ahead. And the first day shall be in holy convocation. Ye shall do no manner of servile work therein. But ye shall offer a sacrifice made by fire for a burnt offering unto the Most High. And let's see what that sacrifice is. Read. Two young bullocks and one ram two young bullocks and one lamb they had to prepare two young bullocks and one ram for the next holy day which is a sabbath that is the preparation it's speaking of not for a regular sabbath they had to prepare for that so joseph went to the emperor and asked for christ's body before they prepare for the feast of unleavened unleavened bread 
one day after the Passover. See that? Because when the sun go down on the Saturday after they bring Christ's body down off the cross, they needed to do a new sacrifice for the Feast of Unleavened Bread one day after they do the Passover. So that preparation is not speaking of a weekly Sabbath, but a high holy day. Let's go there. Mark 15 and 42. Read it again. Saying Mark chapter 15 verse 42. Go ahead. And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. It was the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That Sabbath, read. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of the Most High, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Yeshia. Now let's show you according to Leviticus 23 that you have double Sabbaths. Read Leviticus chapter 23 verse 5 And the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover That's the Lord's Passover And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord Go ahead Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread And the first day ye shall have an holy convocation Ye shall do no servile work therein But ye shall offer an, an offering made by fire unto the Most High seven days and the seventh day is in holy convocation. You shall do no serve our work. As you can see, you have more holy days within eight days. You got the Passover, which is a Sabbath. You got the Feast of Unleavened Day uh, of Leavened Bread, which is a Sabbath. And you have the eighth day, which is the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Three Sabbaths within eight days. Okay, now we're going to prove that Christ rose in between these Sabbaths of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I need you to go to John 19 and 31. St. John chapter 19 verse 31. Go ahead. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Go ahead. For that Sabbath day was an high day. To prove to you it wasn't a regular weekly Sabbath. It was a high holy day. Feast of unleavened bread. It wasn't the regular weekly Sabbath. That's the precept you need to prove that. Read. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with them. But when they came to Yeshia and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. They didn't break Christ's legs. Fulfilling the scripture that his bones would not be broken. Okay, now here it is. Christ passed. The spirit went, to, went into, into the Hades first to preach to the souls. Okay, and now it's what you would call dawning or coming into Saturday night. Or the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The, pre the preparation for the killing of the two bullocks and one ram. Saturday night. Now, the question is, if it's Saturday night, how is it that when Mary came to the sepulchre of the Marys, three days later, the body was gone? And how is it that that was the first day of the week when the Sabbath is when Christ was crucified. Wouldn't the first day of the week be the next day? We're going to prove to you right now what was there in Matthew 28 when Mary came to the sepulchre. What you really should be seeing and the fact that they have deceived the world into believing it's the first day so that they can have some type of biblical backing for their Sunday worship. Now remember you got your holy day Passover, your holy day Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a day, a day later. Then you have, at the end of the seven days, the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is also a Sabbath. Listen to this clearly. Matthew 28 and 1. St. Matthew chapter 28 verse 1. I want you to read it how you see it first, mm -hmm. and then I want you to read it in the Greek, okay, to show you that, that, that they, they actually injected words. They injected words so that you would believe that this is the first day of the week. 
I need you to get that first out of the Greek so you can show them what we're looking at here. Turn around your computer if, if, if you can and show them the direct translation out of the Greek first so that they can take a still shot once they go over this video. I know everyone will be going over this video here. I need you to read the direct quote from the Greek outside of the English before translation. Read it. This is from the interlinear scriptural analyzer. Matthew chapter 28 verse 1. It states, it may sound a, a bit funny because it's directly from the Greek, but I'll, I'll read it. It says, evening yet of Sabbaths to the all lighting and to one, one of Sabbaths came Mary the Magdalene and the other Mary to behold the sepulchre. I'll read it again. Evening yet of Sabbaths to the, evening yet of Sabbaths to the on lighting and to one of Sabbaths came Mary the Magdalene and the other Mary to behold the sepulchre. Now as you can see it's not denoting, de denoting at all a day of the week. It's talking about between the Sabbaths between the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Mary came, the Marys came to the sepulchre. It don't say first day at all from the original translation out of the Greek. So why would they want you to believe it was the first day? That was the only way they can convince the whole church to come worship on the first day of the week. But let's show you out of the, out of the Bible itself I want you to hold this for me here if you don't mind the microphone if I can without disturbing things I'm going to turn this completely around so that you all can see this what I'm looking at I'm looking at out of Eastward a breakdown of each of each Greek word I'm looking at a breakdown of each Greek word thank you brother mm -hmm. and the word day is grayed out it's not even the word day is not even in the Greek the word day is not even there in the translation at all Y'all see that? The word day isn't there. Now. Allow me to, to read this. Strictly from the Greek. Being broken down. From Matthew 28. It says, in the end, which that end translate to late in the day. So it says, late in the day of the between two Sabbaths. That breakdown Sabbath breaks down to this. I need you to read this, the interval. It says the interval between, the interval between two Sabbaths. The interval between two two Sabbaths which is Sabbaton Hebrews 7 6 7 6 that means when the sun was it says in the end in the end which Greek 3 7 9 6 which means after the close of the day between two Sabbaths what Sabbaths the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the close of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As it began to dawn towards the first, the word first there is one. It began to dawn one of the one of the of the days of the week. It began to dawn one of the days of the week came Mary Magdalene. The word is one, not first. 
which is one of the days of the week between the feast of unleavened bread. The scriptures don't give you a day at all. The example I can give you if I said one of the days you and I went to a store or one of the days you and I was walking down the street. Remember that day. It's not denoting what day of the week. It says the first which is one of the what? Days of the week or interval between two Sabbaths. One of the intervals between what? Two Sabbaths. One of the intervals between two Sabbaths came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. You see that? So that first day of the week, they wanted us to believe that. They injected that type of understanding so that they can bring forth the Sunday worship through Christianity. Now, I need you to read this right here. And this comes from the journal notes from the Strong's, what it signifies. Read that right here, where it says, does, it does not signify. It says Strong's 4521 does not signify in the evening of Sabbath. It does not signify the evening of Sabbath, but what? But Sabbaths. But what? But Sabbaths. But Sabbaths. S-A-B-B-A-T-H-S. It was an interval between the two Sabbaths of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. See, Christians will never understand this because they don't even know what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is. She came in the middle of the Feast of Unleavened Breads and the stone was rolled. Christ was gone in the midst of two Sabbaths. It doesn't even denote the first day of the week. The word there is one. One of the days between Sabbaths, she came to the sepulchre. They injected the word first so that they could bring forth Sunday worship and inject that within society and have all believers in Christ follow an antichrist day. Daniel 7 and 25. I need you to read that. Uh, Daniel chapter read. 7 verse 25. Daniel 7 and 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And the saints of the Most High have been wore out in captivity. Read. And think to change times and laws. And they shall think to change times and laws. So when the Masoretes and the Jewish and the Roman people uh, uh, put their hands in our records, they purposely switched a few things around so that they could lure the slaves into believing in pagan gods and following pagan deities and worshiping on satanic days. But if you go into the Greek, you'll see the days they're mentioning in the English don't exist. The only similarities between the linear concordance of the Greek I'm reading here and this, the only similarities is that it's between Sabbaths when Mary came to the supper. It's not even giving you a day of the week. See that? And that's why there's so much mystery concerning when did Christ rise? When did it happen? What day of the week it is? Why? Based on their injections and confusion. So by default, if you're confused, you'll just go along with the institution. Okay? There, was, there should have never been any significance on what, what day of the week Christ rose. At all. It had nothing to do with nothing. The fact that when they went there three, late, three days later and he was gone is the significance. He rose three days and three nights. He was there in, 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 the, in, in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. That's all that matters, not what day he rose. They made it, they made it of significance knowing that they were looking to, 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 to convince the whole world for Sunday worship. They made that of significance. What day of the week? They put the word or made us believe that it was the first day of the week. When really the translation is 
one day between intervals, between Sabbaths. One day between Sabbaths, when Mary came to the sepulchre, he was gone. It's that simple. Look at the Greek, you'll see that word day don't exist. You look at the word sabbaton, and it gives you the translation, the interval between two Sabbaths. What two Sabbaths? The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Crystal clear. If you look at the Greek words and read them yourself, it's crystal clear. It have nothing to do with Sunday or the first day of the week. That word week there translates to Sabbaths, plural, Sabbatu, or in, it says intervals between two Sabbaths, which really is midweek. So if you want to look technically, Christ rose, if you look at Saturday when, when before they pulled him down from the cross, Saturday to Sunday is one day, Sunday to Monday is the second day, and, uh, and Monday to Tuesday is the third day. Technically, it's around Tuesday. Have nothing to do with Sunday worship. All right? So I wanted to put that out there so that everyone can see what we studied. And this brings closure to that understanding altogether. Before I go into the second part of the lesson, let me open this up for questions because I know there's questions. I see Gabar was like, wow. <laughs> oh yeah, you can't get around that. Let's just see if y'all have questions specifically on this particular, do you, is there any confusion whatsoever based on what we brought forth? The key to the matter is that in order to understand when Christ uh, 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 rose from the dead or when he was crucified, you have to first understand the holy days. It's impossible to understand anything if you don't know the holy days of the Most High. And it was key when we found out that the Sabbaths, that, that the Passover falls on the Sabbath every year. It falls on the Sabbath, Friday sundown, every year. And you know they couldn't let it be that way because if you understood that, no way, you would know by default that no way Christ could have rose on a Sunday. If you knew that the Passover feast was every Friday of every year, you would say, okay, Christ died on Passover night. He was crucified the day later, which was Saturday morning. Sunday can't be the day Christ rose from the grave. So therefore, you can't use that excuse for Sunday worship either. So they could not, they could not have allowed you all to understand this. All right. And I put it out with the Greek, with the references, with everything you need. So you can see for yourself that what you're reading in Matthew 28 was certain word injections. So we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater just because first and one seems synonymous to them. They knew the significance of changing one word. Because if they say first day of, of the week, when really it had nothing to do with the first day of the week. It was one of the days between intervals of Sabbaths. <laughs> See that? The 364 days is in sync every year, flawlessly every year 
Why? Because it's a complete cycle of sevens. Every year it falls on point. We know beyond any shadow of a doubt that Christ did not rise on a Sunday. He rose three days from Saturday. Okay? Three days from Saturday is when Christ rose. It was, it was nowhere on a Sunday. All right? Give them the Greek reference you were reading directly from the Greek again. Uh, that's called the Interlinear Scriptural Analyzer. I just say you can go... Uh, to Google whatever web page you use, type it in and download it for free. Can you type that in for them? So they'll know how to get that. You can get this for free and which it gives you the same exact information, the same exact translation that was there before uh, uh, it was translated to English. So that means all the Hebrews knew before the translation, all those that followed Christ knew that it had nothing to do with Sunday. The interlinear scripture analyzer, which points out the Greek words in which uh, the New Testament was translated from. Okay. Any other questions concerning this in particular? First Corinthians 16 and 2 also translates the same exact way. It's an interval between Sabbaths. So that's Paul telling them not to do it on a Sabbath. Well, first fruits can be easily broken down because first fruits is counted is counted from the beginning of the year. You can count up to first fruits. So that's not an issue at all. You can actually calculate them based on knowing the first day of the year. All right. We will upload this on YouTube as a connection to our lesson of the 364 day cycle. Absolutely. The two bullocks, I, I, don't, I, can, I, I don't know if I will reference them to the two that was killed with Christ. The only thing that I can reference with the two bullocks is that uh, these were further sacrifices, you understand, for preparation because the feast wasn't just one day. The feast went out throughout the week. And what we're going to do, we're going to see if some people can do it, put some people together in which every day of the week, certain people can go to others' houses and share during that week. No, all flatbread, but, you know, have a little beef the next day, which is bullock, and you have some goat another day. Just in sharing during the whole week of feast, opposed to it just being one big thing for the year. So. You know, a, a lot of people are not able to do this. You can do this within your own homes, but this is how it was practiced in the past. This is going up on the website, the full lesson. We have the full lesson here, and we're going to type it out, and it's going to be with the Greek broke down, breakdown. It will be on the website, so you can understand that it had nothing to do with Sunday worship at all. Sunday or the first day have nothing to do with Christ's resurrection. And a matter of fact, Christ was crucified one day before Sunday. You don't look at the Gregorian if you are dealing with the cycle of the year. You don't examine the Gregorian at all. What they do with the Gregorian to try to keep it and cycle every few years is to give it a leap year where they take and add days away to bring it back through a 364 day cycle. But if you go 364, regardless of what they do, 
trying to get back on your cycle, you're on the correct cycle year to year. All right. No, we don't deal with the Gregorian at all. We, we don't need, there's no need to. All right. The high Sabbath uh, that night after Christ's crucifixion would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You got the Passover, which is the first day. Then the second day is a new high holy day, which is the 15th day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was a high holy day, a high Sabbath. The two witnesses is, is Israel and Judah. All right. Uh, the emperor during, uh, what's his name? Aurelian. Aurelian was the emperor of, of 274. A Roman Emperor Aurelian. All right. That was the introduction of the sun in Roman worships. Later on, uh, they instituted it as law under Constantine. Let's go to Acts 21 and 26. Uh, Acts 21 and 26. Go ahead. Then Paul took, took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. They were still at this time practicing uh, uh, within the the institution, you have to realize they grew up all their lives doing this from children. They didn't. They did. This was their culture. You understand. A matter of fact, Paul was doing this up until his age. This is just regular tradition of Hebrews. You understand. But eventually, it faded out. Those generations faded out where that wasn't necessary. But Paul. And the disciples were still operating with what was going on during that time. And it, it kind of clarifies it when you read yeah. a few verses up. Let's read a few verses up there. Uh, Acts 21 and 21. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So this is what they was accusing Paul of. Exactly. It says, verse 22. What is it therefore the multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this, we say to thee. So they're now instructing Paul to do this when he goes to the temple. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify themselves with them, and be at charges with them, that they might shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So he's supposed to do this as a show to the, the people who are in control of the temple at that time that he was also a follower and keeper of the law. Exactly. So he was showing them that he, he's not denying the law by following Christ. Mm -hmm. You understand? And that's why Paul says he became all things to all men that he should gain a few. Because those things didn't make him. It was his spirit in Christ. But he did certain things amongst the people to show them in an opportunity to pave a way in which he can show them Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, it wasn't unlawful for him to do that. Someone asks, Shalom elders, is it, is it correct to show Mary did not embalm Christ because of the seven day Sabbath is law? Well, in a way you can look at it that way, but 
the preparation for Christ's burial was that ointment. That's the key thing that you can show in scriptures in which instead of the embalmment, they was dealing with the anointment of the oil, which was the frankincense that was preparing Christ's burial. All right. All right. I think we went a little past the time, but I guess next week we can go into the teachings on Ruth to show you that we went, did the research to prove that Ruth was and is an Israelite. Uh, crisis, she's through crisis lineage, and we're going to prove in an extensive lesson next week that Ruth is an Israelite so that you can prove it yourself. She was one of the mothers that linked into Judah that brought forth Christ. All right, so she was of Israel, and we can prove that beyond any shadow of a doubt. Of course, we said that she was a Moabite, but we didn't want to talk about it until we understood absolutely sure and have proof to bring that forth. All right? Yeah, they attempted to try to phase out Friday sundown to Saturday altogether. That is correct. How would you operate in a Christian church if you are looking to bring someone to Christ, but they do communion in the church? Do I use grace to partake in that communion? Uh, you would have to yourself weigh your liberty and I'm going to say that in this way if you are there to convince someone else to stand on what's right but yet you're taking communion under something that's satanic could it work in the reverse the answer is yes so I don't know your scenario to know whether or not your liberty in Christ will offend someone while you're doing that only you know your circumstance if you feel that this is an opportunity that you can bring people to Christ and yet your liberty will not cause others to stumble, then sure, but only you will know the answer to that. Sister Vicki, she says, in past notes from our lessons, I've written down that Christ rose on the Sabbath. Now you say he's rose around Tuesday. I'm confused. And Sister Vicki, I understand why you're confused, and that's why I'm clearing it up here. You have to realize, in the past, we were dealing with the Sabbaths according to the moon and what we were shown at that time. Okay, now that we've grown to the knowledge of the truth and to further study, we've realized that the Most High has given us information on the cycles of the year and what implications that have. So we're not going to stop researching and bringing forth truth. We can only teach you what we know at that particular time until the Most High reveal uh, the information. All right? Because the word sabaton was there, we could say beyond any shadow of a doubt that, okay, it's Sabbath and not Sunday because the word Sabbathon is there. But when you look further into the words that's there in Matthew 28, it says between intervals of Sabbaths. All right? So, Sister Vicki, I hope you understand that. It's not as if everything is changed. But when it comes to something as significant as, significant as this, after we've been teaching this for so long, we must bring it forth so that our brothers and sisters get it correct. All right? As we receive the information, we'll give the information. Okay? Um, someone is asking about the holy days, and I'm glad you're asking about that because I'll give the dates here. Again, Purim this year is February 27th and 28th. This year, it's 27th and 28th. The 28th is the Days of Gifts. 
The Passover is March 29th. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is March 30th. First Fruits is May 18th. Memorial Blowing of the Trumpets is September 14th. Day of Atonement is September 24th. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, September 29th. Okay. And the Feast of Dedications, which someone call, some people call the Feast of Lights, uh, is December 8th. And Purim next year is the 26th and 27th. All right. But I wanted to stand that correct because I gave the dates of last year for Purim a couple of weeks ago for this year. And I want to make it cor correct that this year is the 27th and 28th. Uh, someone say here you're welcome sister Vicki someone says here and, and, and the website is really done we just looking to launch it now okay so that's pretty much done and uh, I think it's going to be nice. One other website we wanted to give brothers and sisters some. Uh, another website a sister worked on. I think Elder Lawyer had some sister classes in which he gave projects for sisters to do. And through these projects, a lot of good things came out of these projects. So one of the sisters made a website based on some of the projects that they had to do and it, it, it's real nice so we want to put this website out there so that you can share in some of the information that came from this particular uh, project uh, what is it it's, it's called our beauty of wisdom it's called the beauty of wisdom block, block spot the beauty of wisdom is that dot, dot blogspot dot blogspot dot com. The beauty of wisdom dot blogspot dot com. The beauty of wisdom dot blogspot dot com. A lot of good information on it as far as encouragement, uh, pregnancy, what to do during those periods of pregnancy for sisters, different recipes to do. And what's good about this, if you have things to share with these particular, if, you know, we can always upload and help upload and share things this way. You understand? So the sister put together a great, a wonderful site that shares, that can, you know, that you can all share in different things that sisters, daughters of Zion's, daughters of Zion have in common. All right. So. This is something that sister put up and it was nice and we're going to promote other things. If sisters want to do things, we're going to promote it and put it out there. You know, but we can't have a thing where sisters are teaching and bringing forth teaching and all that. We, that's one thing that we can't have. All right. As far as the Hebrew Pope, a matter of fact, before the Sith Lord, the guy that's about to s step down, b before he before he went into his little whatever, you know, they they probably covering up a scandal with this guy. But anyway, before the Sith Lord stepped down, years ago, around uh, two thousand two. When, it, when the scripture says that he shall reject the God of his fathers, before there was any such thing as Barack Obama, we was looking at this brother that would be the Pope. We knew that it would be an Israelite someplace in high regard, reverence all over the earth. We knew it would be an Israelite at the very end, 
recognized. So we were looking at this brother first before they rolled Barack Obama out. And he's a top, he's a top witch. He's a top warlock in Africa. So it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me. What better way to destroy God's people that at the very end, you got a black president and a black pope. If that don't make black people think that they're safe, I don't know what will. They'll make, they'll make believe that everything is fine. We got a black pope and a black president. You understand? So if, if that would be the total deceptive tool to keep our people still. You understand? And guess what? You know, I'm looking at it both ways. You're going to find out just how, how much the Catholics love black people if you see a black pope. If that don't turn the whole world into atheists, even Catholics, I don't know what will. I mean, you, all, all those racist Italians and all that and the racist people that are Catholics, and they see a kissing the ring of a black man, no, nah, they'd be like, no, nah, we good. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I think that that's going to be the year where the, the Church of Satan get its highest recruit. But uh, but you know, it's, it's deeper than that. It's, you know, I'm just being a little jovial here, but it, it's deeper than that. It doesn't matter whether or not the person is black or white. It's the satanic antichrist institution. Uh, because these positions are, are changing faces. But it's the same demon operating behind the scenes, which is the antichrist spirit, Satan himself. All right? There was no meteors. That was a fallen angel that happened the other day. That was a fallen angel. A matter of fact, before class, lawyer was mentioning something to me concerning the X-Files. Maybe you want to share that, lawyer, real quick. Uh, yeah, I think I put this out there before. When you go back and watch, I believe it was the, the very first episode of the X-Files, if anyone remember that particular show. And in the first episode, you had this situation in which what they called initially a meteor, a meteorite. You had these two uh, low-level uh, military personnel who were watching certain things on the radar, and they seen something falling out of the sky. And the general that was over them told them that it's just a meteorite. But after he got done telling them that it was just a meteorite, he got on the phone with somebody who was higher than him and told him that a fallen angel had fell to the earth. And then the second time this happened, something came out of the sky. They first tried to diagnose it as a meteorite again. But the second time this fallen angel came down, it started hovering. It didn't fully hit the ground. It started hovering. So they asked, so what is this? So that's just a small example to show you that they even know in TV and on, the, on these TV shows, they drop exactly what's happening in the spiritual realm. And we always say that the, the news is pretty much a, a spin on what's really happening in the earth. It's a spin to convince people into an alternative reality instead of examining what's before your eyes. There's no asteroids falling out in space. There's no planets operating out there in space. There's no rocks and debris falling to, to the earth. That's all garbage, okay, that they talk, they're spewing there. That, that's a verbal defecation. I'm going to tell you right now, according to scripture, According to scripture, when you look into the testament of Solomon, it tells you that the spirits go over the firmament to listen to the heavens. To listen what's going on in the heavens because there's communication there with the Most High and his angels on the outside of the firmament. And when they can no longer hold themselves, they hurl back to the earth. Gravity pulls them back into the earth demons and fallen angels so they got the power to go on the outside of the firmament for a time but gravity pulls them back and they come hurling to the ground like a rock or lightning that's your meteors it's fallen angels and and and, and you you can read it all through revelations when it says a star fell a star fallen they're fallen every day as of the days of noah then shall the coming of the son of man be what happened during noah's time Right before Noah, 
fallen angels. What were the fallen angels doing? Cross splicing animals, changing the DNA of the Most High's makeup, destroying all of the natural creation, splicing different fruits and plants, making new land creatures, making new field creatures, making new fowl of the air, creating everything it could to destroy the creation of the Most High. They just found something they claim was prehistoric, an eel mixed with a shark at the bottom of the sea, saying it's prehistoric. It's not prehistoric. They, they cross spliced an eel with a shark. Now imagine what this thing is gonna do underground to the most high, I mean in the waters, to the most high sea creatures. All the fish and everything is trying to get away from this thing. That's, what, that's why the Bible tells us a certain number of the sea creatures is gonna die. It's not just from the oil spills and everything else, it's from the hybrid sea creatures they've created to destroy our food source also. Also, look at Magellan. The Magellan disease. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't have the immune system to actually fight against it, but Magellan disease, um, it, they have it where there's strands of silk mm -hmm. that's in your actual DNA strand. And a lot of people are already infected. They're doing it through the chemtrails and everything. People with acute immune systems that can actually detect it, it comes to the surface. Their body fights so well, it comes to the surface. And it, it comes as sores, and you can see it immediately. But some people, you never know it's in them. Mm -hmm. Come to find out what they're looking to do, it's to connect people. Your, your, your metal situation make you almost a cyborg on Android where you got met metal thread threads in you so when the mark of the beast comes you can be easily controlled like an antenna controlled by the all C and I now tell me how how mad is that and they say well it's just a, a disease it's not a disease you are tainting and destroying the most high's creation and turning people into something else it happened that same way before the flood there's no such thing as genetic uh, diseases or genetic disorders. Everything they're telling you is a lie. It's, it's, it's what you call genetic engineering. They're changing the Most High's creation. They're doing it through the food. They're doing it through everything you can imagine, especially through the pharmaceuticals. They're changing our makeup. Okay, they're exploding and destroying our DNA. So when you see little things on your body and things on your body that, that looks foreign and it looks strange, and they, they, and they and the doctor look at it and say, yeah, we, we know, yeah, yeah, you can take this or take that. Yeah, we see a lot of this coming up. They know exactly what it's coming from. To you, you feel you're just breaking out. Even acne. Acne is a direct side effect of vaccines. Even acne. When you get to a certain age and your body starts breaking down and your immune system is not as strong as it was younger, all that thing, all that stuff is trying to come out of you. And, th and they lie on you and say, they lie to you and make you believe that, okay, that's just a normal progression when you get to a certain age. You're going through puberty right there. No. It's your vaccines. It's total social and genetic engineering. But through the spirit of the Most High, we thank the Most High that we got people like Truman Burst. We got people like Sister Bev and those that understand the natural remedies that's out there. That's why they're trying to fight against the natural remedies. Because your, bi your, your body itself has what it takes to reject everything foreign. No matter what they're trying to do, if you put the right things in your body, it can destroy and get rid of these things that are foreign within us. So... I mean, when it comes to anything, when people can be getting little warts on their hands and all that, all that's vaccines. Every so-called sexually transmitted disease you can name all came from genetic engineering and vaccines. Every last one. There's no such thing as natural so-called sexually transmitted diseases. This is what they created through eugenics so that we can have a fear of reprocreating so that it can be less children. <laughs> I'm on every level. 
And then they, then they lie to you and claim that there's incurable diseases. Therefore, if you believe it's incurable, then you're not going to take any measures to get, get, to get rid of it because they've already programmed you to believe it can never go away. That, that message itself is ridiculous for a believer. If you believe in Christ, what is incurable? <laughs> Christ says, as much faith within you, be this day healed. If you, if you believe that it's healed, that's the curing process. So they taught us in medicine not to believe in that innate spirit the Most High gave you to fight. If you believe that you cannot be cured, you're already on your way down. Because you don't have no belief system. So they put that incurable thing out there as a social programming to make you believe that there's diseases that you can't fight against. It's all a lie. The Most High made the perfect creation in man and woman. The perfect creation, which there's nothing foreign that if we believe there's nothing we cannot overcome if we really believe what the Most High created in us. And that's what the government and the satanic powers fear, that we're going to tap into that information. Also, what we want to do, and we're going to do this, and, I, and, and we put it out there for other brothers and sisters to do this also amongst the unions that they have. If there's certain things amongst each union that you want specific prayer for, we're going to write those things down, or you can write those things down. And we'll come together for a few hours or as long as it takes to pray all together for those specific situations. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, if there's something that you feel it's so private that you can't say, that's fine too. You can still bring your spirit and we can pray and anoint each other that the Most High can help us fulfill what we need to get through, get through these times. So prayer is a key part Matter of fact, it is the key part of what we need to do going forward. Even if it's only for a few minutes, like you're going through something, you're struggling, whatever the case is, say, listen, I just need a quick prayer. Can you anoint me real quick? Can you anoint me and let's pray, you know, and no matter what we're doing, we'll stop and we'll do a prayer for brothers and sisters to, to get you through that so that we can have the spirit of the most high fight with us together opposed to brothers and sisters feeling that it's an individual fight that they they dealing with things within themselves that no one understands and they got to struggle struggle by themselves with it no no more of that we go, we we're going to open up prayer even as even as for 15 minutes even as for 20 minutes you write these things down we pray together on it and we in what we pray together on it's establishing the heavens where two or more gathered, Christ is in the midst. So if we pray together on it, eventually, even if it don't happen overnight, the spirits have it working. So that a lot of our, our things, a lot of what we need, the Most High know, and he fulfilled those things for us anyway. But there's other situations we cannot overcome if we're not praying together. And that's one thing these Satanists that control this world have over us. Is that whatever their, their gods tell them to bring forth for sacrifice and whatever the prayers they got to do and whatever rituals they got to do, they do them religiously to, to keep power. You understand? They have a, a, a little girl somewhere that kidnap, kidnapped, total evil and wickedness, and be praying over that because that's what that God required. Well, we don't require that. We don't require other people's blood. But our lives is the living sacrifice. So we have to just put those things down and say, okay, even though everyone is busy doing whatever they need to do, we need to, we need to start everything with prayer and we need to end everything with prayer. You understand? And as we come closer to the end.
Brimstone is like perpetual hot coal. That's what brimstone is. We anoint ourselves with, with, with extra virgin olive oil. And we use numbers uh, 6 and 22 on down to the end, right? Mm -hmm. Numbers 6 and 22 on down to the end. Okay, with that, we're going to say all praises be to the Most High. Oh, someone asked what I feel about, about Christopher Dorna. Good question. Good question. Well, my opinion on that is you have a brother who is trained, who was trained on a high level by the American government. He leave the armed forces, which he killed and did all types of special ops for, for a job uh, to be a policeman in L.A. Because really, there's not too many jobs you can get but in law enforcement now if you're prior military. In the event of this well-trained brother doing his duty as a police, he realized that the deck is stacked against our people over there in L.A., and seen the, the, the total disrespect and in, in total uh, uh, evil plot there is against black people in LA using the police force as a strong arm to, to beat us down. There was this one woman who would just jackboot everyone. She was a Caucasian woman. And she would, you know, not that that have any significance. We got a lot of our sisters, black women that are in the police force, tripping out of their minds too. A lot of them are known sodomites and lesbians or whatever they call themselves now. So she wanted to jackboot everybody she come in, come in contact with. And she loved the sight of blood. So this guy, every place he go with this particular officer, She's putting cuffs on women to the point where they would bleed out. And they would bleed in sores. And one time she ripped the flesh off of one woman. You understand? So this woman was known for, and you have to realize the police force, they hire a lot of Satanists and, mm -hmm. and people that are dealing with all types of uh, uh, e evil scenarios. They love blood. They love, they, they, they want the job to do that. So he started reporting this woman. And instead of it being a thing where uh, uh, they take care of this woman, they moved her around from place to place. They needed that. That's part of the machine. Internal Affairs ignored this brother's reports against this woman. Perpetually, every place she go, there's blood. Right? And then he's seen the evil that the police force was doing against black people in LA, outside of her. So what happens? What happens? He said, well listen, I don't, I don't want to be a part of this no more. They, they, tried, they outed him. He figured that what he's going to do is he's going to tell people the truth of what's going on on the police force. And out them not only for what this woman's doing, but what the plans are concerning what's going on in L.A. With the information he know concerning our people. They're like, no, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So they sent out a hit team to, to kill this brother. But the brother is black op. The, the brother was top, you understand? He, he was up there. Mm -hmm. So they just couldn't take him out. So everybody they sent, he was, he was taking them out. So what happens if you got a rogue guy who's trained against the police force? What he's going to do? He may go into the neighborhoods if he get loose and start training other people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand? If you can't work for those who've trained you, they, you, they got to put you down. 
So he made a CD and he made a, a uh, he made a CD and he wrote a letter that he sent online to let people know his side of the story in order that they would demonize him. To show you that they were able to intercept everything. They intercept everything he had and changed the letter and, and made him out to be a cop killer. And used the media to demonize him immediately before he could get help from anyone, his family, anyone. And when I seen it, I'm like, you know what? Even if this brother give himself up, he's a dead man. They, they do not want this brother alive. They will do anything to make sure he's dead on the spot. I'm going to show you how wild it is. They went and shot up two trucks that had nothing to do with him. Didn't even have the same description. It was just close to the description. Shot up one truck, 70-year-old woman and his daughter in the, and her daughter in the car. Shot and wounded this 70-year-old woman in a car. They shot first. Two separate cars looking for this guy. To show you the order was to shoot to kill. They, they just running around rogue shooting people on the street with a car that they think is similar to Christopher Dorner's. Finally, the brother, may, I think he, you know, because he's trained that way, he torched his truck someplace. Eventually, they found his truck, sent 125 police officers out to try to figure out where he was. Burned him alive. Burned the brother alive. Now, my question is, usually when you have a situation this high profile when I was coming up you would have some type of black leader would be at the NAACP or something and say well listen you can turn yourself into us turn yourself in and you can talk to us and then we can represent you or we can bring you before the police and we can get this together usually have Jesse Jackson or somebody who would come out and say well listen we're not going to have a thing where you're killing people we are united into hearing what this brother have to say before you destroy him through through public perception and you crucify him before you know before trial before this brother get a chance to have his say in court that don't exist anymore now who, who are we now especially in America we are we we they have deemed us terrorists they didn't use the Christmas bomber, which was which the brother didn't do anything. The the Christmas tree bomber, the so-called underwear bomber. Now the narrative have switched to you can expect us to be put up as a new terrorist now throughout the world. And it's no coincidence that at the same time, Barack Obama is looking to go into Africa. But it's okay. It's okay. It's okay because they are about to wake the lion. And we mention it all the time. Yeah, a lot of us are not going to make it through this. It's going to be a 90% situation where the earth, you know, where, where a lot of people are, are judged during this time that, that may fight. But I'll tell you, they are about to wake, awaken the lion. Judy's about to rise up and it's not going to be a, a, a good thing. Oh, someone says, here's an autopsy. Let me read this from ABC News. Let's see. Before we pray out here. ABC News. I'm sure they, they're going to tell us exactly what happened. There's no spin here. Oh yeah, there's they, they audio feed that says, listen, let's burn this MF down. Let's burn it down. Get the, get the burners. Get the oil. Get the gas. All right, Steve, we're going to uh, we're gonna go forward with the plan with the, with the burner. Got it. I want it to, like we talked about. Seven burners deployed and we have a fire. 
Copy, seven burners deployed and we have a fire. Material, medic engine six out. On by. Is the uh, EOD unit in route and on the air? EOD 131 Medic engine 6 out. They would uh, they couldn't go into where this guy was. This guy was highly trained. You 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 go into a place with this guy. You you going you you coming up missing. This this guy. Th th these this is a perfect example. When they show you the movies like The Born Identity and all that, that really exists. Mm -hmm. You get guys if they can't be if they can't if they won't kill for the government. They can be used to, to train others. Can't have that. Yeah, they had a drone looking for him and everything, and no one said anything. I'm like, okay. Uh, our man Bin Laden, who we created, is gone, so. Former LA cop Christopher Dorner and police in Big Bear, California. Authorities now getting a clearer picture of just what went on in that cabin where Dorner made his. Look at this guy. Anyway, let me read the story. These talking heads are something else. I mean,. They get paid top dollar to sit there and read a teleprompter. What a job. Christopher Dorner, the, the, the former, this is CBS News. The former Los Angeles police officer who went on a killing rampage appeared to have killed himself, authorities said. Oh, so them saying let's burn this mother and let's torch this place that have nothing to... They have nothing to do with, it. I mean, what, what was that about? The autopsy showed that Dorner's cause of death was a single gunshot to the head. There you go, they, they go freedom. Hey, hey, yeah, land of the free. It should be renamed Land of the Brave, Home of the Slave. They lying on this guy. Dorna tied the couple up and put pillowcases over their heads before driving off in, in, in their purple Nissan. I'm going to tell you, I bet you any matter, I bet you, all the things they claim he did, they did. Yeah. If you read right here, it says... What they say? Right here it says Christopher Dorner hostages. He just wanted to clear his name. He just wanted to clear his name. He went to some people was like, this is what they try to do to me. I need y'all to listen. They spent that to he had hostages and looking to kill him and all that. Brothers and sisters better wake up. Because guess what? We're all, we're all, according to the satanic system, Christopher Dorner. They can spin us any way they want. So we just got to come to Christ. And, and brothers and sisters better wake up with uh, joining these law enforcement agencies and all that. They, had, they, they were chasing a guy in the UK the same way about a couple of years ago. They said he's missing and all that. Same, remember the story? Remember that? Killed him on the spot. Okay, who else we got here before we pray out? Someone asks, do we believe that this is the beginning of Rex 84 where they say before they begin martial law, they will kill the black and minorities in the police and military. Absolutely. It's the beginning of Rex 84. You notice 
throughout the United States. They're going after the, su the black superintendents, the black principals, those that were in city council, those that were former mayors, everyone that's in a high position is now being investigated for some level of uh, what they call that, uh, improprieties with their position. What politician haven't done something wrong that they can't pull a dossier out on? But now all the, they're pulling out all the dossiers on the black people that had position and prestige throughout the whole United States. Look at it. See, but that's what they get for receiving their 30 pieces. What you think? that you betrayed your own people and, your, and the people you've been amongst and eventually it don't come back to you? So they just use you to destroy the inner cities knowing that eventually they was going to move you out of the way anyway. So a lot of these people who are in these high positions, city council, who become principals of schools and all that, who's part of the eugenics program, that become superintendents and get all these high positions, the majority of them know that they're selling out their own. They know they're selling out the population. So now, it's their turn. We do have the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew for those who ask that. And uh, I know we have that in the academy, so you, you definitely want to become a part of the academy so you can get some of this information on that. Let's see here. Okay, I guess we're pretty much done. But it'll be a blessing to have brothers and sisters, and we do have brothers, who can train brothers and sisters how to defend themselves, even without arms. That would be great. I'm looking at Brother Dorna. I mean, th this guy was, he like he could run through a wall. I mean, we would love to have somebody like that training brothers and sisters how to defend themselves. Anytime it takes 125 to put you down, that, that reminds me of when Judah was running around here. <laughs> you understand? In the Old Testament where they would send 300 guys down and take down a city. So obviously there's something, there's something great about when we do have that knowledge of what to do with ourselves. It must be something great if it, it'll take 125 people to get you. We need more brothers, not brothers that's out of their mind and, and dealing on that level that they try to portray, but brothers who have the skills to teach others how to defend themselves. Someone asks, is the anointment only when we're sick? No. We anoint... We, we anoint it before the class today. So you can anoint for other things. Okay. You want the Most High to give you wisdom. Want the Most High to bestow patience on you. Love on you. Or, or to help you get through scenarios. So. Someone asks what would you consider doing other than going to college? putting your time towards something more useful instead of getting yourself in debt for the rest of your life for an education that means absolutely nothing. Okay? There's ways you can educate yourself. Or there's certain colleges you can go to in which you don't have to worry about incurring that level of debt. So, every, every situation is, is different. If you got a scholarship or someone paying for, for you to go there, Okay, if you can throw out the bones and take the knowledge that comes with it, okay. With that, I'm going to say the I'm I'm going to say we're going to say the Lord's prayer in Hebrew, and then we're going to pray out and we're going to wish you all Godspeed and hope you all have a pleasant remainder of your Sabbath. Okay.